Welcome everyone, bienvenidos a todos a este taller, a esta sesión con Robert Hill. Eh, hoy viene a presentarnos el taller How to Invent and Use Reading Activities that are Engaging, Creative and Effective. Eh, bueno, welcome everyone, bienvenidos a todos. Eh, para mí es un placer poder presentar a, a Robert. Robert, bueno, que eh, se graduó en, en literatura inglesa en la Universidad de Oxford y enseñó en España, en Grecia y en Inglaterra antes de, de mudarse a Italia. Él enseñó inglés durante muchos años también en la Universidad de Verona y Milán y es autor, editor y formador de, de profesores en la actualidad. Yo tuve la, la suerte de, de conocer a Robert en, en 2015 cuando vino a dar talleres de formación para profesores de inglés y bueno, si algo me sorprendió gratamente de, de Robert es esta inmensa capacidad para crear entusiasmo tanto en estudiantes como en profesores por, por la literatura y la, la buena literatura y la literatura en inglés. ¿no? Podía coger un título, una imagen, un personaje, una palabra, cualquier parte de un libro es para él una herramienta para crear una, una enseñanza de, de aprendizaje significativa. ¿no? Entonces, bueno, eh, yo creo que sin más dilación puedo pasarle la, la palabra. Yo creo que toda esta magia que, el, que, que ha conseguido construir y que construye con, su, con sus libros se refleja muy bien en esta nueva colección de, de Wall Stories que, que también formarán parte de, del taller de hoy. Así que, welcome Robert, thank you very much for coming. Y you, adelante. Pa. Thank you very much, Pao. Um, I hope I'll be able to, to live up to, to, to your presentation uh, of me. <laughs> okay, uh, hello everybody, and, and, and thank you for coming at whatever, um, whatever time of the day it is where, where you are. We have quite a lot to do, so let's begin straight away, shall we? I'll put up my PowerPoint. And um, we're going to begin uh, with uh, a story. Uh, can 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 you see the PowerPoint? Ah, okay. We're going to begin with a a, a story because we don't want to talk uh, uh, in the in the abstract. I really want to talk in a uh, in a in a concrete way. So uh, we'll have a, a a story, and then I'll talk about activities. But before we do the story, uh, I have to do some pre-reading activities. Um, We're here to talk about after reading activities, but uh, in order to be consistent with uh, with my methodology, uh, I'd like to begin um, uh, with a bit of warm up for the story. Uh, I'm going to show you two pictures there from the story, and um, I want you to think for a very short time, question of seconds really, um, the order in which you predict, in which you think these pictures will occur in the story. Will the first picture be the first picture or will it be the second picture? I'll give you a very short time to decide. Oh, and a little bit of vocabulary. We need to know the word seal, uh, which you're going to see as an animal in the water. Okay, there's one picture. Is that going to occur before or after the other picture I'm going to show you? And there is another picture. Okay, so here are our two pictures. Which one comes first? Which one comes second? Well, you can think about that just for another five seconds. I'm doing there is what I always like to do, uh, which is to kind of oblige, really, uh, the students to imagine the plot before they read the story. Um, I think that, uh, no, I'm sure from experience uh, that if, if students kind of predict a plot, form an idea, then they will be enthusiastic to, uh, to read the story, to find out if the plot in the story is the same as the plot that they imagined. So that's my, my motive for doing that. 
and to satisfy you, this is the order in which the pictures will occur in the story. Okay, first that one, and then uh, that one in the boat. Um, you may want to just think about uh, what this object is for a moment. All right, now I'm going to give you an activity. Uh, I'm going to give you another picture uh, and ask you where you think this subsequent picture fits into the story. That's a picture. OK, have a good look at it. Another picture from the story. And uh, I'm going to give you three possibilities. Uh, and here you can actually write something in the chat box. Just write one or two or three. My question to you, ladies and gentlemen, is do you think this picture will occur here? That is before the other two stories or here between the two stories, uh, pictures, I beg your pardon, or here after those two pictures, one or two or three, first position, second position or third position. Uh, do please write something down. I see Andrea has written down two, two. Zoe's written down one. Uh -huh. Have a good look. It's, it's nice to share what other people are thinking. Two seems to be popular, although, one is popular. Too. Ah, Santiago Garcia. It's our first. Um, oh, and there's two. Oh, it's a sudden flurry of votes for third position. Five more seconds. Four, three. Okay. Let's read the story. You'll find out as I read the story. Um, uh, uh, where the pictures occur. Uh, now, this is a story from um, from our book. I'll say our book because I wrote it with my wife, Jennifer Gascoigne. Um, we're not going to look at the whole story. Time does not allow us to look at the whole story. So uh, I've cut out bits of the story. And where I've done that, I've just put a little summary in italics. Uh, it'll take about seven minutes to read the story. But as I said, we need to have something concrete to talk about. OK, so here's a story for you. I summarise the beginning. After an unsuccessful day at sea, a young fisherman is walking home. On the shore, he sees some people singing and dancing. You can see that in the picture. But when they see him, they run into the sea and disappear. That's a summary of the beginning. Was I dreaming? The fisherman asked himself. Were they real? He was walking slowly up the beach when he suddenly saw something. It was lying on a rock. He went over to it. A seal skin, he said aloud. He picked the skin up and looked at it. I'm going to take this home with me, he said. The other fishermen will be very surprised when I show it to them. Then I'll take it to the town and sell it. I know that people pay a lot of money for seal skins. He put the skin over his shoulder and started walking home. Everything was quiet, except for the sound of the waves breaking on the sand. Then the fisherman heard another sound, a very soft sound, the sound of feet on the sand. Someone was following him. Who was it? Did they want to steal the sealskin? He stopped and turned around. There was a young woman standing a short distance from him. She had long, dark hair, and a pale face. She was very beautiful. When he saw her, the young fisherman fell in love with her immediately. And then he saw that she was crying. Beautiful lady said, why are you crying? Tell me, perhaps I can help you. Sir, she said, looking into his eyes, that seal skin on your shoulder That seal skin on your shoulder is mine. Please give it back to me. I'm a selkie and I can't live under the water without it. The fisherman knew this. There were many stories about the selkie people. People said that these strange creatures could change their shape. They looked like seals when they were swimming in the sea, but they sometimes came out of the water and took off their seal skins. When they walked on the land, they looked like humans. I can't let her go, he thought. I love her too much. I want to keep her with me forever. He held the seal skin more tightly and said, 
Dear lady, please be my wife. I'm in love with you and I don't want to lose you. If I give you your seal skin, you will go away. Without it, you'll have to stay on the land. Come and live with me in my cottage. I'll do everything I can to make you happy. I promise. The fisherman said nothing more for a long time. His heart was beating fast and his mouth was dry. He wanted to take the young woman in his arms and kiss her. Oh, sir, cried the girl, please give me my seal skin. I can't stay here. I must go back to my family. They will be worried about me. She looked at him sadly and big tears ran down her beautiful face. The young fisherman was a kind man, but he was also stubborn. Dear lady, don't cry, he said. I'll look after you. My cottage is warm and comfortable. There will always be plenty of fish for you to eat. You will never be hungry. So please say you'll marry me and make me the happiest man in the world. He smiled at her and put his strong arm around her small white shoulders. The girl didn't know what to say. He's young and handsome and he loves me, she thought. If I marry him, perhaps my family will come and see me sometime. Well, the fisherman said, will you be my wife? Yes, she said, I will. Well, they get married and for the first few weeks, the fisherman keeps that seal skin under his coat. And then he goes and he hides it in a cave not far from his cottage. During the following months, he worked hard to make his wife happy. He was stubborn, but he was also a kind and generous man. The Selkie woman understood this and began to love him. Some evenings she sang beautiful songs for him. On those nights, he was the happiest man in the world. The years passed. The fisherman and his wife had seven children. The Selkie woman loved all of them very much. She doesn't want to return to the sea now, her husband thought. She has her children and she's happy with her life on land. But he was wrong. When he wasn't there, the Selkie woman often sat at the window and looked at the sea. Her face was sad and sometimes her eyes were full of tears. What's the matter, mother? Her children asked. Why are you so sad? She always kissed them and told them not to worry. I'm just dreaming, she said. Well, one day the fisherman and three of his sons were away fishing. The daughters are in the village. And the youngest son, who was alone at home, finds the selkie woman at the window, gazing at the sea. Mother, what's wrong? He asked her. You're always so sad when you look at the sea. That's because I was born in the sea, she replied without thinking. It's my home, but I can never go back there. Your father took my seal skin away, so I have to stay on the land now. The boy was young, but he understood immediately that his mother was a selkie. Don't cry anymore, mother, he said. I can help you. He ran out of the cottage. Five minutes later, he returned with the seal skin. His mother was very surprised. Where did you find it? She asked. One day, father took me with him to a small cave in the big rock on the shore, he said. He took the seal skin out of a hole in the wall and looked at it for a long time. This is something very special, he said. Then he put it back in the hole. I didn't know what it was then. Now I know it's your seal skin. Here, take it, mother. The woman took the skin and kissed her son's head. I will always love you, she said. Holding the skin close to her, she ran out of the cottage and down to the sea. When she got to the beach, she quickly put on her seal skin. Then she jumped into the waves and swam away. The fisherman and his three sons were returning home when they saw a group of seals in the water. One of them swam towards the boat and barked at the fisherman and his son. Sons, there was a strange expression on its face. As the boat moved away, the fisherman heard a cry, a very sad cry. He turned around, but the seal was no longer there. When the fisherman heard the story about his wife and the seal skin, his heart almost broke. But he wasn't angry with his youngest son. You are a kind and loving son, he said, and you were more generous to your mother than I was. 
The fisherman and his children were sad for a long time, but they knew that the Selkie woman was happy now. The land wasn't her world. Her world was in the sea. Well, that's the end of the story. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And now we're going to use that story uh, as um, a place where I can uh, exemplify uh, some of my thoughts about activities to do with the reading text. Um, I'm going to show you uh, quite a few activities and comment on them. Uh, now, they're not all uh, wonderful. Some of them I like more than others. I'm certainly not recommending that you do all of them. Uh, and there are plenty more kinds of activities that I'm not including included in this talk. Perhaps I'll come back for another talk one day. But these are some. Uh, some of them are in um, um, and are in the um, in the book uh, that uh, I've written. The books I've written with my wife, and some not. Anyway, let's begin. I think that uh, a good place to begin with um, an activity to do uh, after reading is with reaction. I mean, we we uh, we do react uh to stories and very often uh, it's not something at the beginning of the story that we act react to first we react to something at the end of the story because it's the it's the moment uh, uh the climax of the story now here it seems to me a fairly obvious question is uh does the story have a happy or sad ending now mm, that's a good place to focus on i'm sure um, but uh, the question is, I mean, I don't think our reaction is, oh, it's happy or it's sad. I think, don't think it's a, a binary opposition. Um, I mean, we could ask the question, does the story have a happy or sad ending or something between happy and sad? And that, I think, is a more realistic question. Um, but I think everybody is going to choose to say it's something between happy and sad. How's about if we um, we actually try to make it a bit kind of uh, numerical? Um, we might, we might, we might, depending on our class, say, does the story have a happy or sad ending or something between happy and sad? Mm, circle one of these numbers between one and six. Now that numbering is also going to allow us to uh, uh, to compare our reactions in the first instance. Notice if I use this device, it's called a Klein. I'll tell you that later. Um, I use even numbers because if I put five, one, two, three, four, five, there's a temptation to choose three, which is right in the middle. Uh, here, you're not allowed to do that. I think you've got to decide whether it's more happy or more sad. Ladies and gentlemen, uh a few well no a few seconds to write in the chat box i'm interested to see one or two or three or four or five or six for your reaction to that story whether it's got a happy ending very happy ending write six very sad ending write one or something in between thank you andrea ah variety <laughs> well, we've got from one to five there. Now, so uh, there is lots to talk about because quite clearly the activity doesn't end there with a number. That's a kind of um, a well-meaning way of trapping the students, if you like, uh, into, into, into saying an opinion. It's quite easy to say one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, but then why? And that will send us back to the story, um, back to the story uh, to find um, uh, evidence, to use a, a clinical word, about whether it is um, uh, uh, happy or sad. Um, that kind of activity is a grading activity. This line here with two extremes is called a Klein, sometimes useful. You can have, you know, 
guilty or innocent, happy or sad, sympathetic character, unsympathetic character. Very often uh, you can think of some sort of binary opposition in the story. <coughs> the number allows us to compare feedback in the first instance <coughs> and then go back to the text. Another reacting um, uh, question. What you see is going a bit more slowly uh, than what I see. Uh, <coughs> um, another reaction, I think, you know, once we finish the story straight away, we might think of which character in the story uh, do we feel most sorry for? Now, again, I can make that numerical. You might have thought that instead of most, I meant more. Uh, but in fact, um, there are quite a few people there. There's the fisherman and the selkie woman. Then there's the youngest child, the other children, the selkie woman's family. I mean, I could ask you to rank that from one to five. Personally, I think that is unfocused. I think really it's between the fisherman and the fisherman's wife, the selkie woman. Who do we feel more sorry for, more sorry for? Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to write in the chat box. I'm interested. Um, the fisherman, if you feel more sorry for the fisherman, or the selkie, if you feel more, fox, more sorry for the selkie woman. Oh, Enrique says, fisherman, of course. Okay, Encarna, the youngest child. Again, it's a minimal response activity, but the minimal response, which is kind of, if you like, easy, will then um, oblige us, if you like, to, uh, to talk about it in more detail. Um, it's a ranking activity, even if you've only got two characters, uh, the fisherman and the fisherman's wife, the selkie woman. Uh, we rank them. Uh, and again, that sort of binary uh, opposition you'll find in many stories. OK, now, um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, an activity uh, borrowed from uh, drama. Uh, not drama in the classroom, although it it is used about drama in the classroom, but from um, actors. Um, often when they are rehearsing, um, everybody on the stage freezes, doesn't move. Uh, and then anybody can go around and ask the characters what they are thinking at that particular moment, uh, which is invisible to the audience, but it's a way that actors get into a role. Now, uh, let's take what seems like um, a fairly ordinary question here. Uh, how does the Selkie woman feel as she leaves the cottage to return to the sea? I mean, it's a good focus for a question. Um, I don't know if she's totally decided at that moment that she's going back to the sea or what she, ha she has a, um, a tempest of conflicting emotions. I don't know. It's, it's a good focus to that question, but uh, we can make it more interesting, I think, if we ask it this way, which is, and it'll be arriving on your screens now, before she leaves the cottage to return to the sea, the Selkie woman writes a short letter to the fishermen and their children. I mean, she doesn't have much time, so it's going to be short. It's going to be a note. It's going to be spontaneous. Write that letter. And I think that it focuses on the same area as the first version of the question, but it's much better, in my opinion, for a variety of reasons. Um, it, it puts it into the first person. I'm leaving you. I've got my seal skin. It, it, it's, it, it does that. It puts it into the first person rather than the third person, and that makes it more vivid. It's dramatic because the students have to imagine they are the Selkie woman 
and not some anonymous outsider. It means the convention in literature and the convention in the world is that when you write a letter, you're telling the truth. And everybody does, you know, when they leave their boyfriend, they leave their girlfriend, they make a confession. A letter is when you tell the truth. Writing a letter like this is grammatically simpler. Um, you don't have to say uh, she felt that she had to leave, you know, with the, with the tense change. It's, I have to leave. Uh, it's, it's, it's direct speech and simpler. And it's creative. Um, here we're given something creative to do um, instead of a kind of anonymous uh, summary. Okay, here's another example of, um, of thought tracking. Uh, when the, um, when the, the youngest son, it's often the youngest son, he stays at home, uh, finds her gazing out the window and asks her, why are you so sad? I'm just dreaming, she said. I mean, we could ask the question, describe what the Selkie woman is dreaming. And again, that is, a um, a third person activity or a bit of suspense here as it comes up on your stream um, ask the students to write an entry in her secret diary for that day the same thing applies here we've got a diary instead of a letter but we've got the same conventions um, uh, people tell the truth in their diaries People tell the truth and it's first person and it's a much more dramatic way of, of getting at the same, um, the same place in the story, which is what is she dreaming? Uh, we can ask students to write a diary throughout the story, but I'll come to that later if you don't mind. Um, we can ask students to speak or write in role. Um, up until now, uh, those two activities with thought tracking, uh, I've asked you, uh, I've asked you to ask uh, the students um, to consider um, what characters might be thinking. Uh, here, I'm asking you to consider what they might be saying. Um, now, the seal um, barks very dramatically. I've got a barking dog outside my window at the moment. <laughs> um, what actually does the seal cry? Put its cry into words. Uh, now, we could give this um, finding words for a character. Uh, we can make it a free activity with absolutely no indication uh, about the number of words, or we could uh, put a constraint on it. Um, and ask the students uh, to, uh, to only use a certain number of words. Pictures are really useful for doing this activity. Um, uh, all the stories in, in the material I'm talking about have got three or four pictures um, in, the, uh, in the text. And uh, at this point, we've got the seal barking speaking in a seal language but if it was in english what might it be saying free answer or uh i could um i could i could give you something like that it looks if i give you uh, a gapped text like you're seeing now it looks as if i'm um uh, i'm interested in accuracy rather than creativity well, up to a point, um, creative things like poems uh, do have constraints. You know, they have to rhyme. Uh, here, uh, I'm, I'm telling you that you've got to find words to fit. It's not from the text, uh, although the text will, uh, will tell you um, uh, kind of like a parenthesis of what the seal is saying. What do you think the seal is saying? If you've got time, we've got like one minute. If you'd like to write that sentence in the chat box, 
you can think the speed of lightning and write at the speed of lightning. I, mm, 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 all my home see. Okay, can anybody type quickly? No takers yet. I really love you all, would be like the Maite has written. Uh, I truly love you all, my dears. <laughs> I love you with all my heart. I'm going up. I will miss you all. Can you go on, Almudena? Almudena. I will miss you all, my. I really all love you all, my love. I miss my home, which is my miss you all, my sweets. I go back home. Good, 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 good. I love you all, my children, but my home is in the world. That's interesting. She's speaking to the children and not to the fisherman. Nice one, Aurora. I miss you all. My family, my home is in the sea. Okay, fantastic. Now, there is no right or wrong answer. No right or wrong answer. It's uh, it's fun, actually. It's quite good for a, um, a kind of revision warmer um, between one lesson and the other. Um, many of the things you've written would be possible. Um, uh, and one of you, I can't remember who, was very, very close, if not identical to what I thought. That's not the right answer. Uh, it's just an answer. I will miss you all, my darlings, but my home is in the sea. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you some questions now. And at first thought, you might think that there's nothing in common between them. But there is something in common between them. we we'll wait for them to come on screen. Why do the Selkie people sometimes leave the sea and walk on land? Why does the fisherman keep and hide his wife's seal skin? Why doesn't he throw it away or burn it or destroy it in some way? When the Selkie woman doesn't come back, what do her family say and do? You are one of the seven children. At school, a friend asks you, what's your mum like? What do you say? And fifthly, what is the wedding like? Describe it. Now you've seen they, uh, you see that they, 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 they focus on on different areas in the story. Um, they may they may seem not at all connected, but they are. They are connected in a way. Uh, now. Um, all of those questions actually explore things that are not in the story, things that the story does not tell us. Um, one writer, a modern writer, uh, Neil uh, Gaiman, uh, writer of graphic novels as well as ordinary prose, has compared the short story to an iceberg, uh, by which he means that what you see in the story is kind of like a lot less than what's behind the story, the background, all the things that we are not told. Now, um, if I can mix my metaphors, there are a lot of gaps in the story, things that the story does not tell us. And it seems to me that these are really interesting areas to explore with our students. Uh, so that first question, why do Selkie people sometimes leave the sea and walk on land? Well, there's a gap in the background, in the setting. Um, we could ask students to think about that. Why do they? Um, they could even search online. The answer can be a big answer, like a whole origin story of how Selkies came to exist, or a small answer like, they are amphibious people. They are supernatural. Sometimes they are human and sometimes they are seals. 
Why does the fisherman keep and hide the fuel skin? He could burn it. Then she'd never go back into the sea or destroy it. Now there's a gap in the plot. We're not told that at all. Um, I don't know what students might, well, I, I do know what students might think because I've, I've done the story with them. They might come up with something like um, destroying the seal screen is too violent and cruel. It might, it might even kill the Selkie. He doesn't want to do that. He loves her. Or it might be, you know, uh, an own goal, a boomerang. Uh, the fisherman might be cursed for doing something like that. Um, uh, what do the Selkie woman's family in the sea, what do they do and say when the Selkie woman doesn't come back? We have, the story tells us nothing about um, how um, her family reacts. Uh, it's a gap in, 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 in the characters there. Um, if we examine that question, we are looking at the story from a different point of view. Um, if the children at school ask, uh, what's your mum like? Well, the child, we, we, we don't have the point of view in the story of the children, apart from the youngest child. Um, this will give us another point of view. The child might concentrate on the, uh, uh, the way that she tells, uh, she sings beautiful songs or or the child might be impressed by the sadness of the woman, or he might say something about the relationship between the husband and wife. Who knows? Uh, the story doesn't tell us about the wedding. Uh, here, if you think about it, uh, different points of view will give us different interpretations of the wedding. I imagine that the fisherman is overjoyed at the wedding. Uh, the silky woman must be very sad at the wedding. It's the beginning of their time together, really. What might another villager, a friend of the fisherman, the best man, think about it? Might another villager notice something odd, notice something strange in the behaviour of the bride? There's lots that can be explored when uh, you ask readers uh, to look at what the story doesn't say. Changing the text uh, is um, a very common activity that you find in, in methodology books about reading. Um, it's sometimes, uh, and, and, and the commonest way of changing the text is to change the ending. It's sometimes a productive activity, sometimes not a productive activity. Um, here, it does actually work. Uh, there's quite a good moment. Uh, when uh, the little boy um, gives, uh, uh, gives his mother um, the seal skin and the mother takes it. And then you can say, oh, can you think of another way in which um, the story might develop now? Um, I've put some ideas down there. Um, interesting here. It doesn't always work. It doesn't always work. Traditionally, Selkie tales end, uh, well, I won't tell you now. <laughs> I'll tell you later. I'll keep you in suspense about the traditional ending of Selkie tales. Okay, now uh, we're getting towards the end of our time together. Um, for creating, we've got three big opportunities. We've got prequels sidequels and sequels. Prequels, as you all know, is what happens before a story begins. Uh, it's often the backstory of a character, you know, what the character was like as a young person, or it may be an origin story, how things came to be like that. Um, in this particular story, our concrete example, um, is it useful? I don't think we need to know the backstory of the fisherman, um, how he, you know, became a fisherman. I don't think that's important. How Selkies came into being is interesting, maybe. 
uh, the word cycle. Uh, well, it did exist. People don't use it anymore. Instead of cycle, um, people now use the expression parallel story, which is a story, but not before the story starts, but another alternative story told from the point of view of another character at the same time as our story happens. I think with this story, um, about five or six uh, diary entries in the Selkie Woman um, about uh, how they met, the wedding, and then when she starts having children, and how she began to love the fisherman, but how she always dreams of escaping. That, I think, would be good. That, I think, would be interesting. And sequels, uh, which will be coming up uh, on your on your screen soon. Um, sequels are really uh, useful for the teacher because we, the teacher, um, can uh, can say, "Hey, think of a sequel which is going to take place just minutes after the story ends, or hours after the story ends, or months, or years, or decades after the story ends." Uh, and that could be useful with this story. There's many, many I'll leave you to think about that uh, yourselves. And um, of course, stories, particular folkloric stories, uh, allow us uh, to make connections with other stories, with films, uh, with other things in the world, uh, with other things in other cultures. Um, the Selkies are shapeshifters and uh, mythology and legends are full of shapeshifters, Greek legends, Dracula. There are many shapeshifters around. I've chosen that as just one example of um, an ingredient, an element of this story which invites connections with other myths, with other legends, with other um, cultures. Um, we will look at another one. We'll look at another one now. Um, this is the last thing I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to talk about here. Uh, an activity type I'm very keen on, uh, which we have inherited from content and language integrated learning, which is to ask students to think about what they know with what they want to know, and then afterwards with what they have learned. Uh, and you can see it here, what I know, and that's the K. What I want to know, that begins with, that uh, explains the W, and what I have learned. So uh, I'm going to ask you to um, uh, to think about um, selkies and mermaids, which occur in uh, in in lots of cultures. Um, the picture here is a contemporary Scottish artwork. It's about it's a selkie inside a seal. Uh, a Disney mermaid here. <coughs> A manatee from the from the waters of the Caribbean, ladies and gentlemen. How much do you know about mermaids and selkies? Uh, here are some questions: true, false questions, true, false, or don't know. And I'm not asking you these questions before. Oh, sorry, after you have read an article as a comprehension check. I've got my doubts about true false questions in that context. I'm asking you before you read an article. And this way is to, is, is to sort of provoke you into thinking about what you think you know, uh, what you want to know, what you don't know, and what you really don't know. Um, there's We can't really write these in the chat box. There's too much to do. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, think yourselves. The word selkie comes from an old Scottish word that means seal. 
this is kind of like guesswork on your part, but you know, make an educated guess, true, false, or really don't know. All Selkie stories come from Scotland. Well, what's your hypothesis? True or false or really don't know. Selkie women sometimes stay with their human husbands even when they find their skin. Now, oh, that's something I promised to tell you. Is that true or not? Moving on to mermaids, is it true or is it false that mermaids don't change their shapes? And then we have these questions about mermaids and selkies. And having um, attracted you or tempted you uh, into, uh, into saying whether you know that that's true or false, or you don't really know, but you have a hypothesis, or you really don't know, uh, that is when I would show you uh, an article. And uh, in the article is when it comes up on the screen, uh, you will find that uh, you just need to read that Mas grande, Mariano. What is that there? I think you can see that anyway, though. The word selkie comes from an old Scottish word that means seal. Ah, that was true. Selkie stories are also told in Iceland, Faroe Islands, and Ireland. Ah, so they're not just Scottish. These stories are often about a selkie woman who must marry. If she finds her skin, perhaps even many years after a marriage, she always chooses to return to the sea. She never tries to meet her husband again. Ah, so they always go back to the sea. She might meet her children. Mermen are not as beautiful as mermaids. Mermaids who never change their shapes. And Irish mermen are very, very, very ugly. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you want to find out more uh, about uh, this story or about um, the book that the stories are from or uh, the books, all four of the books, uh, here are some websites. Um, when you get the um, recording of this talk, of course, at your leisure, you'll be able to photograph or write down <coughs> what those websites are. And uh, I've overshot by a few minutes. I do apologize, but, but lots to say. Um, now uh, I'll hand back to Pau, who's running this um, webinar, uh, to find out if you've got any uh, questions uh, to ask me. Okay, Pau, back to you. I just need to... Uh, minimize that. Thank you, thank you very much, Robert, for for all the, the explanation. Um, para los participantes, si podéis ahora en el chat eh, hacer ve, vuestras preguntas, they can ask you some questions. Uh, we have uh, ten minutes left. Podemos si Podemos aprovechar el tiempo para, para hacer algunas, algunas sugerencias. Oh, um, yes, I can see one there. Are you in favor of allowing students to use the internet uh, to discover cultural background? Yeah, because like to do to, to there's lots of things um, uh, to um, uh, to research about the mermaids and selkies in the story. Yes, I am. Uh, you know, you will know as well as I know. Um, uh, that um, uh, students use their devices uh, all the time in all sorts of situations. So it would be silly uh, not to allow them uh, to use that in class or at home. Uh, 
in particular, I think, uh, well, you might say a website uh, is going to be ungraded material, authentic uh, material, uh, and not graded like the story. Um, but that's okay, uh, because the kind of things I would ask them to search uh, uh, would be um, answerable uh, in terms of skimming and scanning. So not reading uh, attentively the whole text, the whole website, but just looking for who, when, where, what, how much, how many, those sort of uh, factual uh, pieces of information that you need to skim or scan. Uh, uh, I'm really um, in favor of, of, of using because uh, very often um, you see students around the same screen. It's a collaborative uh, rather than necessarily a solitary activity. Um, if they look at uh, websites in uh, a foreign language, Spanish in your case, well, they still have to kind of like answer the question in English. Uh, so that's an example of linguistic mediation, which is a good thing. Um, if you want to look at uh, our books, my and my wife, you find that we um, we give them uh, keywords to search in um, in bold. So if they type those words into their search engine, they should go to a site which will answer those questions, the questions that we ask uh, very clearly. Um, uh, there's also, by the way, if I can just say something promotional, a really good teacher's book with every single book, which also tells the teachers what the uh, uh, what the information uh, we are looking for is. Um, there's lots of interesting things about uh, mermaids and uh, uh, and selkies. Like um, uh, I think we ask them uh, uh, to look up, and it's very easily findable. Uh, the diary of um, Christopher Columbus. Christopher Colombo, Cristobal Colón, <laughs> uh, who claims in his diary to have seen mermaids uh, off mm -hmm. the coast of Santo Domingo. Uh, mm -hmm. And he complained that they weren't as beautiful as in pictures. Um, he probably saw manatees. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Esther. Uh, that's, uh, that's not a question, it's a comment, but as, as welcome as a comment. <laughs> Do you teach the reading vocabulary first? Uh, Maite. Uh, words that are going to be very significant in the story, uh, we, uh, I pre-teach. Um, now, uh, so that probably is going to be, um, well, you can look, look at the books, six or seven or eight words, which are really going to be key. Uh, so uh, I and my wife, we pre-teach those words um, with a picture clue or definition or something like that. But then uh, I think if you're going to do that, and I do do that, it's not enough just to pre-teach the word, but make the students work with the words uh, so to sort of make them their own. So the words that we're going to pre-teach, apart from being above the, um, the level, but they are they are part of the story, you know, the students have to know them. To give you a very clear example, let's say that you are teaching or doing the story Robin Hood with elementary students. Okay, you know, A1 students. Hmm. Now the word bow and arrow are not on A1 word list, but you try teaching Robin Hood without using bow and arrow, and you don't get a very interesting story. So you have to teach bow and arrow. Um, all right, so the words we pre-teach, we make the students work with them. Make, sounds a horrible word. Uh, so how do you think the word is going to be used in the story? Do you think the word is going to be in a positive or a negative context? Do you think this character or that character, because we actually um, uh, review who the characters are first. Do you think the word is going to be associated with this character or that character? So we build pre-teaching of vocabulary in with prediction uh, work. And uh, I'm very happy with that procedure. Um, thank you, uh, Anna. Um, uh, these activities are ah, the activities, not texts. Uh, 
Well, yes, or even adults more so. Yes, I mean, um, uh, because the um, uh, the uh, uh, the idea of uh, um, concentrating on or focusing on what is not in the story uh, is you could you could think of that as sophisticated and very suited for, suited for adults. Um, toddlers, well, role playing. Um, characters who are not in the story uh, for example role playing all those seven children while well, the little child in the story we've just done uh, actually has a speaking part uh, the other children don't have a speaking part They're, they don't exist at all if you like but with well toddlers goodness with four five six year olds if you were dramatizing a version of that story obviously this story um, the way it's told uh, is too high for uh, pre-A1 learners. But yes, I think the activities are fine. Like with the um, uh, writing a diary entry or writing a letter, well, that can be as eloquent or as simple as the student can. Dear, and the fisherman is not even named, which is a feature of folkloric stories. Uh, dear husband, I have my seal skin, I must go back to the sea. I love you, but I love my family more. That would do. Whereas uh, like a B2 student might write, oh, my dear husband, I've been thinking about this every day for the past seven years and so on. Uh, so um, a task is, is adaptable. By the way, um, uh, you, you know, uh, in, 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 in the teacher's book that I mentioned, um, uh, there's lots of ideas for alternative activities as well. Um, you know, you have a few activities in the book and lots more in reserve. Uh, are there advantages in using? Oh gosh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, um, these books that I've been talking about are um, are all myths and legends and folkloric stories. It's a great advantage to the materials writer. That's like me and my wife because with a traditional folkloric story or a myth or a legend, uh, you can adapt it at any level. You can make it very, very simple, as fairy stories often are, or quite sophisticated. The same story is adaptable up or, or down. Um, also, that means uh, that as folk stories and myths and legends belong to everybody, um, since the beginning of their oral birth, <laughs> they've been changed from storyteller to storyteller and then changed in different versions and changed into modern day film versions. That means it's an open invitation to students uh, to rewrite the endings, rewrite any parts of these stories. They're not sacred texts that we can't rewrite. Uh, no, they exist to be rewritten. And of course, they are full of culture. Um, and in the story we've looked at today, there's we will, two elements are like shape shifting and impossible love. You know, an impossible love of the Romeo and Juliet type uh, of um, uh, oh gosh, was los, los, los amantes de very well. <laughs> um, uh, those in Guanajuato, Guanajuato, in the the little alleyway of lovers. You find those themes in folkloric stories and myths all over the world. So it's quite easy and it's an invitation to the students to to find something in in uh, in the story which um, has an echo. No, no, that's putting it the wrong way around, which is in common, in common, in common with their own culture. Cinderella is is told in, I think, in all cultures all over the world. Okay. Robert, just the last question, Enrique, well, it's a comment. Enrique, tell us that he used to combine art with, with storytelling. What do you think about it? Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, a, a sophisticated word is transcodification, um, which is far too many syllables to say. Uh, and that means uh, transferring uh, something, a story from one genre to another genre. Uh, and transferring a story into into a song or artwork is fantastic. Um, the the relationship between art and and text uh, is um, uh, is age old uh, in 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 Sicily and in Italy. 
traditional storytellers uh, are called Canta Storie, uh, and they have um, a panel of pictures, and they point to the pictures uh, in order to prompt them to tell the stories. Um, uh, and nowadays, first of all, the comic and the cartoon, and now the graphic novel shows the uh, the, the, the uh, synergetic relationship between uh, the written form and uh, uh, and the written and and and, and the uh, and and the image. Um, Enrique, I'd love to be able to see some of uh, <laughs> of, the, of of the images your 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 children have drawn. Have, have drawn. Um, Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you really much, uh, Robert. It was very, very, very useful. All, all that you explained to us. And para los participantes también agradecerles eh, la participación y recordarles que el webinar de hoy quedará grabado en innova.vicentvives.com y les esperamos para las siguientes sesiones. Muchas gracias por atender. Thank you, Robert. Nice to meet Thank you, you again. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.